ancient life on Earth. Over millions of years, plants and animals lived and died. That decomposed life sunk deep into the ground. And as a result, an ancient menace was created. Fossil fuels, black oil, coal and gas have created modern society as we know it. This ancient sunlight unleashed global industrial power on a scale never before witnessed in the history of the planet. But when burnt into the atmosphere, carbon causes climate change. 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is happening now and is caused by human activity. However, the fossil fuel industry continues to pull that carbon out of the ground. They drill, they extract, making trillions of dollars. They frack, they mine, earning astronomical profits. We need to keep this carbon in the ground. In order to prevent a catastrophic warming of the planet by two degrees Celsius, we cannot burn more than 500 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. But the fossil fuel industry has access to five times more than that. Almost 2,800 gigatons of carbon pollution is ready to be pulled out of the ground, sold, and burned. We must fight to keep this carbon in the ground, and it is possible. People are ready for conversation. They're ready to understand that carbon pollution is causing this challenge and that there is a simple solution. Put a price on carbon pollution. In the United States, we spent 110 billion federal dollars on climate change events. That's about $300 a person in tax dollars. Well, we certainly need a price on carbon pollution. But right now, it's a free good, and we are using the atmosphere as a sewer, and that has a real cost, and that cost should be reflected in the cost of carbon pollution. In the 50s in London, based on the Industrial Revolution, there was so much pollution, as you see in Beijing and around China today, that you actually couldn't see six or eight feet in front of you. They put a price on pollution, and it changed. You have to put a price on carbon, and that can happen either by through carbon trading or through a carbon tax. And there's a moral imperative there, but there's also a business imperative. And Senator Boxer and I have introduced legislation to do just that. We are going to do it in a way that impacts fewer than 3,000 of the most significant fossil fuel polluters uh, in the country. And the reason you do it is people should not have the freedom, quote unquote, to destroy the planet. They cannot continue to be able to do that with impunity. Government's been subsidizing energy for decades to the tune now of a trillion dollars a year. We need to redirect these subsidies that encourage innovation. That's what we need in the world. But the biggest barrier is money from fossil energy industries that want to defend their market share, which I consider dead industries walking, but they've got tremendous assets underground that they want to be able to mine. Those are trillions of dollars of assets that the fossil energy companies used to evaluate their worth in the stock market. The fact that we need to strand them and leave them underground is not going over real well in those industries. But in fact, if we want to head off the worst uncontrollable damages from climate change, that's what we have to do. Finland and the Netherlands implemented a carbon tax back in 1990, both putting a price tag on each ton of CO2 poison. In the beginning of the 90s, there was a deep understanding that we should do something. We think that the Finnish economy should be based on sustainable energy in order to make our society competitive and in order to save our planet which is, of course, the main target. Since then, several other nations have created their own versions, including Norway, Costa Rica, and the United Kingdom. Ireland passed a carbon tax in 2010. It was fairly simple to introduce. When they see a carbon tax in place, people know that they can invest in alternatives that actually cut out the use of fossil fuel. It starts to have that effect, improving your energy efficiency in your homes or improving industry's energy efficiency. And what we've seen in the last five years is we doubled our amount of renewable energy supplies. So the benefit for the consumers is if, if through those signals you can cut out the wasteful use of energy, then everyone's saving money and it more than covers the cost of the carbon tax in the first place. In Australia, renewables like wind are now cheaper than fossil fuels like coal. Recently, China put a price on carbon in over seven regions and will add more. Now it's up to the United States, where there's good news at a local level. In 2007, 
Boulder, Colorado passed a carbon tax charging $13 for every metric ton of CO2. The carbon tax was generated and voted into place by Boulder voters. So it's a surcharge on electricity consumption, and it's applied to residential, commercial, and industrial customers here in Boulder. The effect has been really tremendous. So once the carbon tax went into place, it has generated about $1.8 million a year. What's been extraordinary is that we've been able to really turn uh, the curve, so to speak, on our emissions just on demand side alone. We actually propose that every single dollar go back to American households. Carbon tax is the right way to go and is actually the conservative answer to global warming. Finally, we're at the point where wind power and solar coming down in price in a quarter of the United States, solar photovoltaics already cost effective. Last year, more wind power was added than natural gas power. And this is true around the world. We have the technologies at hand. We are ready now to really ramp up deployment. The figures for Ireland, I think, show an example that you can actually start cutting out the carbon and your economy still holds up. The world didn't come to an end. I think it's a lesson for the rest of the world. We've been disappointed by the national policymakers who haven't been able to resolve their differences about this. And time is growing very, very short. President Obama is the last president with a chance to confront this problem in, in a way that may head off the worst of the, of the damage. But given the severity of the problem right now, we're not moving fast enough. We are looking at a fight to save this planet. And we have got to be bold, we have got to be aggressive. If it's not going to happen at the federal level or the state level, we in the communities where the innovation occurs, where we were going to be on the front lines of the impact of climate change, need to take it in our own hands and make the changes that we need to see. If national governments won't take action, your community can. We no longer need the dead economy of the fossil fuel industry. We can move our economy town by town, state by state, to renewable energy and a sustainable future. To learn more and join the movement, go to greenworldrising.org. Thank you.